Good morning to the Commonwealth. This is Young Honey with Raw Dog Radio, bringing you the greatest old-time radio station since the bombs fell. We're going to be hitting you with an arrangement of ragtime on a bridge stories and other old world medias. I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. Now, without further commentary, we're starting off with Frontier Gentlemen, a late 1950s story collection by John Denton. Sooner or later, every man meets his Waterloo, even in Montana Territory. At the time Colonel Custer was meeting his, I very nearly met mine. Frontier Gentlemen. with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. I had received permission to accompany a troop of soldiers and packers up to Yellowstone to the mouth of Rosebud Creek and through the kindness of a Lieutenant Snow in charge of the supply depot, I'd found quarters aboard the river steamer far west. There was an air of expectancy about. A scout had brought news that the main concentration of the Sioux Army had been sighted somewhere between the Rosebud and the Bighorn. It was Lieutenant Snow who informed me. Well, they've sent Custer in the seventh, Mr. Kendall. We'll see an end to it now. He'll finish the Sioux. I wish I had known. I'd like to have gone with him. Well, maybe Custer will bring back Sitting Bull or a crazy horse. You'll be able to have your interviews. <laughs> I've about given up hope. Oh, don't worry. If they're still alive when the colonel's through with them, you'll get your chance. Glad to hear it. Oh, they should have let Custer attack the Sioux a long time ago. Well, now you'll see. He'll massacre them. Lieutenant. Oh, how are you, Mr. Kendall? Well, thank you, Captain. Lieutenant, just got word there are civilians up at Castle Butte. I haven't got anybody else for the job, so you'll have to do it. Bring them in, Captain? Yes. We haven't had any reports of enemy movement in that area, but watch yourself. I can't spare you more than four men and a crow scout. Now, if you do run into hostiles, turn back. Don't (coughs) engage them. That's an order, Snow. Yes, sir. And the civilians? Well, that's their lookout. They were ordered in a month ago. If you can get them out safely, good. If not, don't risk the lives of your men. There's been enough heroics around here. I won't risk the lives of the men, sir. Very sensible. See that you don't. Now, you'll leave immediately, and the location is here. You better cross west to Porcupine Creek and then head north. Uh, Captain Thomas, I I wonder, if Lieutenant Snow has no objection, may I go with him? Well, I don't suppose there's any reason why you shouldn't. No? Fine with me, sir. I thought you'd want to be here, Mr. Kendall, when the conquering hero returns. Make an interesting story for your London Times. I beg your pardon? Oh, we'll be back in time, Mr. Kendall. Captain Thomas is referring to Colonel Custer. Oh. <laughs> the young lieutenant and I don't see eye to eye about the colonel. No, we don't, sir. Well, it's a matter of opinion. I won't bore you with mine, Mr. Kendall. Uh... No, he'll issue a horse and a rifle to Mr. Kendall and see that he signs for them. Yes, sir. Good luck. There are times when it's hard to remember rank. The trouble with him is he's not West Point. He resents anybody else who is. Well, you've just had a good look at professional jealousy, Kendall. Odd. I wouldn't have thought that of the captain. Oh, pretty obvious, isn't it? Come along. We'd better get going. You see, the captain thinks it was a mistake to send Custer after the Sioux. Oh, why? Well, our military genius is of the opinion that Custer's a bad soldier. Out for personal gain, that he's too impetuous, that it'll make a mess of things. Uh, 
Of course, there's also the incidental point that Thomas is a captain, two years older than Custer, who's a colonel. And uh, that's where I say the trouble <laughs> is. When I was in the army in India, I had an officer who affected me that way. He was a colonel, too. Dreadful old blunderbuss. <laughs> I was positive I knew more than he did. Well, did you? Well, as a matter of fact, I did. He ordered us to attack a Sikh stronghold. There must have been 2,000 tribesmen, and we had about 400 lancers. I suggested it might be a mistake, and he nearly died of apoplexy. Oh. I somehow wish he had. Only 30 of us got out of that mess alive. <laughs> Our destination was some 15 miles north and west of the mouth of Rosebud Creek. There were seven of us. Lieutenant Snow, Sergeant Wilson, three troopers, and a Crow Indian scout with the intriguing name of Six Toes. Intriguing because, as far as I could determine, he had only five on each foot. We had traveled fast without incident when the scout brought us to a halt. Smoke over hill near Castle Butte. Any sign of Sue or Sam? Have been passing this way. Maybe small party, seven, eight. Sergeant? How long ago, Six Toes? Walk a mile, maybe less. He means 20 minutes or less. Ah. Sir? Six Toes says there's a sign of the enemy, Wilson. Smoke just over the hill. Now, they may have attacked the party we're looking for. Stay here and keep your eyes open. I'm going to ride up the hill and take a look. Yes, sir. Now, I'd, now I'd like to come along. All right, Kendall. Six Toes, you too. Here. Oh. Can't see what it's coming from. Trees are in the way. Well, if it's a raiding party, we might still get them. See that canyon to the left? We could ride through there. Well, nasty place for an ambush, though. Well, worth the chance. We'd come up under cover of the trees. Not good place if Sue got big party waiting. No reason why they should. There haven't been any reports of any big war parties up here. Probably a few renegades. Sergeant Wilson? Uh, look here, old boy. <laughs> It's none of my business, but four men in those rocks could hold off a small army. Wouldn't it be safer to take the direct approach? Open country? You'd stand a better chance. Mr. Kendall, I don't know how you fought in India, but over here, surprise tactics are the only way. Beat the Indian at his own game, out guessing. Yes, very sound. When you can do it. What is it, Lieutenant? You see that canyon, Sergeant? We're going through. If the Sioux are where the smoke is, we'll take them by surprise, wipe them out. Oh, you hear that? Settlers are holding more. Kendall, you want to stay here? We'll pick you up on our way back. I think I'd rather come along. Don't want to miss the fun. We rode down the hill toward the narrow canyon. Lieutenant Snow is sitting erect in his saddle, eyes sparkling with excitement, a smile on his lips. I had seen such a look before in young subalterns going into their first battle, unafraid, not knowing. Get together! Oh! The mouth of the canyon drew closer. The shadows reached out to us. Then we were in it, the walls looming on either side. I didn't look back. I knew from the sound of that first volley what had happened. When I emerged from the canyon, there was only one other man a short distance behind me. It was the Crow Indian scout. Go around the trees! Don't go through! Yeah. Now take a look. See if anyone's alive in there. I'll try the smaller cabin. I... We 
didn't expect to find anyone alive. I saw you on the hill. Fired the shots. I was afraid you'd go away. We better go inside. All burned in other cabin. He's okay. an Indian. He's not coming in. Six Toes is a crow scout for the army. A friend. I heard shooting in the canyon. Did the soldiers kill them? I'm afraid not. We were the only ones to escape. They saw you. That's why they left. Now they'll come back. How many were there? Seven. To begin with. We killed two. Well, not so bad. You should be able to defend this quite nicely, I think. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Six toes. I'm going out to the horses to get the rest of the ammunition and our canteens. Cover me from the window. Oh, there, ho. Oh. oh, boy. Quiet. Quiet, boy. There. I'm sorry. That was a very foolish thing to do. I'm all right now. Good. I've got a gun and ammunition. I know how to shoot. Couldn't be better. Six toes, keep watch where you are. The lady and I will take this side. My name is Amelia Mitchell. How do you do? I'm J.B. Kendall. Did... Did you see a little boy out there? In the other cabin? No, but perhaps he... He was in there. With my brother and the other men. They were putting up a stockade when the Indians started to shoot. I was in here getting some nails. I saw what happened through the window. It was so quick. Then there was the fire. And the cries. I hope he died before the fire. Your boy? My son. Ten years old. It's not right, is it? No, it's not right. You, tall man. Yes. Indians coming, Cheyenne. See them through trees. Where? Wait, you see. There. All right. Now don't waste shots. We'll wait for them to come out into the open. moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Do you have questions on satellites, Davis Cup teams, a new medical technique? Answer, please, with Walter Cronkite as your answer. Hear him every weekday evening on most of these stations, and send your questions to Answer, Please, CBS Radio, New York 22, New York. That's Answer, Please, CBS Radio, New York 22, New York. And now, we return you to Anthony Ellis' production of Frontier Gentlemen. <laughs> for the Cheyenne to come out into the clearing, away from the cover of the trees, but they didn't. Neither did we get a chance for a decent shot at them. The sun began to go down. Shadows lengthened. In the little cabin, a shaft of pale sunlight poured through a crack in the heavy shutters. It was very warm. Amelia Mitchell, possibly 35. Rather tall, her face glistening in the heat, the Winchester rifle held firm in her broad hands. I was suddenly and unaccountably very conscious of her. They must be waiting for nightfall. Possibly. Anything on your side, Six Toes? Nothing moves. You're English, aren't you? 
Hmm. Uh, yes. Where did you go to school, Oxford? <laughs> As a matter of fact, it was Cambridge. Oh. You disappointed? No. I thought it would be Oxford. If my boy had lived, I would have liked him to go to Oxford or Harvard. One of those fine colleges. Strange talking about him now. As though he'd been gone a long time. I suppose I never did have him, really. Not really. Was your husband in the other cabin? No. I've never been married. I came out here with my brother. He thought it would be best for, for us, my boy and me. Best to make a new life. Oh, well, I... You don't have to be embarrassed now that the boy is gone. I'm glad to talk about it. I was a school teacher. After the war, I met a man. He was a returning hero. It was lonely. I never saw him again after that one time. You could have married. No. A decent man wouldn't have wanted that. Well, for me, there was somebody in England. I suppose not quite the same thing, but... Now well, she married somebody else. I think I felt very much the same way as you did. It was a mistake. Funny, you and me, you and I, talking like this. What were you doing here? My brother and the others were in partnership, mining. We thought we might have found a rich vein. Well, when this is over, you'll be very rich. Do the things, see what you've always wanted to, go to Europe, England... <laughs> No, they are... I know. There's nothing we can do. Better go back to your post. Soon dark comes, tall man. Maybe then they attack. <laughs> it's not a good thing to hear. That's a pretty good reason why they're doing it. You afraid? I am a crow. I'm not afraid of noise. I know what Cheyennes do. Of this I am afraid. We'll try a diversion. Might bring them out. And no more than three rounds each. Fire between the trees. Perhaps one of us will be lucky enough to hit poor old Snow. It was no good. I knew that with darkness, they would come. There would be no moon. They would wait and then set fire to the cabin. If we tried to run out, it would be mercifully quick. A bullet. Nothing more. I'm not sure what it was that made me decide. The sight of the woman standing next to me or the sound of Lieutenant Snow's agony. But suddenly, I knew what had to be done. Look here. We can wait until they burn us out, or we can do something. Six toes, will you go out there with me? We are two against them. Woman, no good. She will stay here. I am not afraid to die, as my father has done fighting Cheyenne, but would like to take one scalp with me, tall man. In a, few... In a few minutes, it should be dark enough. If we can get out of here without them seeing us, and no rifles, we'll take our pistols... But I don't want to use them unless we absolutely have to. Hatchet. And knife, quietly. Is good. Now the back window. Then cut around behind them in the trees. They not think white man will do this. Oh, I hope not. Woman fires into trees many times while we go. Yes, and uh, keep it up for a minute or two. Give us a chance to get out there. Out there. All right. I think you know what to do if we don't come back, Miss Mitchell. I know. Goodbye, Mr. Kendall. Start firing. Wait. Oh, the poor Walla. Quietly now, six toes. Mm, you make good Indian. 
Won't be long now, Snow. Won't be long. I can see two of them. Standing over the lieutenant. Another over there, behind high bush. Yes, yeah, that three. Where's the other two? All right, stay here. I'll get the chappie at the bush. You bring back scalp. And the civilized devil, of course not. You get him? I get him. Your turn, dear fellow. Two more and we can use our guns. There? Huh? Where? Two near trees, looking out to cabin. Ah. Uh -huh. Come on. We'll never get across the clearing without them seeing us. Can you throw the hatchet? Very good at throwing. You watch. Together. One, two, three. Oh, blast fine bloody aim you've got. Quick. I can barely see them now. Shoot, and for Lord's sake, don't miss. Shoot! Six toes got three scalps that night. We carried Lieutenant Snow back to the cabin. That he was still alive was a miracle. It would have perhaps been better had he been dead. Amelia Mitchell did what she could for him, but he died in the early morning. When we returned to the Rosebud the next day, the Battle of Little Bighorn was over. As Lieutenant Snow had predicted, it had been a massacre. Custer's troops had been wiped out. Those other wounded under Major Reno's command were being carried aboard the riverboat, the Far West. I stood with Miss Mitchell and Captain Thomas, watching the wounded being carried the ward. Where would they take them, Captain Thomas? Down river to the hospital. Doesn't seem possible. Two of my best friends are with Custer. Porter, Sturgis, both gone. I'm sorry. It was a mistake. A terrible mistake. Yes. I imagine it was. Uh, you and Miss Mitchell will go with the wounded? Uh, Miss Mitchell will. I'll see you on board. You're not going? No. I don't think so. I see. And, uh... And you? I'll be able to help at the hospital. Then sooner or later there'll be a school out here. I'll teach again. Oh, you'll get married. There'll be other children besides those in your school. I don't know. What about you? I'll be sending my story to the London Times, then I'll go north. There's a town called Fort Benton. I hope we shall meet again, Mr. Kendall. I hope so, Miss Mitchell. Well, you'd better go aboard now. Good luck. Goodbye. Frontier Gentleman was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Clark Gordon, Lawrence Dobkin, and Jack Moyles. Music was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The eventual success of the fight for freedom depends upon our getting the truth to people behind the Iron Curtain. If the spark to freedom is to stay alive, Radio Free Europe must remain on the air. You can help keep it there by contributing your truth dollars now to Crusade for Freedom. 
Just send your contribution to Crusade for Freedom in care of your local postmaster. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Dan Coverly speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. There's a fever in the mining country of Montana Territory. It's known as gold colic. Once a man catches it, it can only mean one thing. Life or death. Frontier Gentlemen. an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. <laughs> Fort Benton under Missouri in Montana Territory is what you might call a clearing house for supplies. They are shipped by riverboat up the Missouri, food, clothing, guns, ammunition, whiskey, tobacco, and from Fort Benton on to the west and north by pack train and wagon. The post is also the point of debarkation for the tenderfoot, the inexperienced miner seeking the fabulous gold fields of the territories. It seemed a worthwhile spot to find a story for the London Times, and so on my arrival... I went to the office of the local newspaper, the Fort Benton Dispatch. The editor was an affable chap by the name of John Warren. He took me into his tiny office. London Times, eh? Sit down, Mr. Kendall. Thank you. Well, this must seem kind of like a tin horn paper to you. Oh, not at all, Mr. Warren. As a matter of fact, uh, I rather envy you. My work depends entirely upon whether the editor likes my story or not. If he doesn't, I don't get paid. If he does, well, I'm, I'm in luck. Mm-hmm. Well, let's hope I can put you onto something good. That's very kind of you. Of course, the best thing you could do is to talk to some of the old-timers around. They've got a hundred stories. Well, first I wondered, has there been much gold found in this vicinity? Around Benton? No, most of it's north and southwest of here. Big strikes over to Virginia City and Bannock. Mind you, there's talk. Oh, you, you hear it around once in a while, of gold in these parts. But I never heard of anyone striking it rich. Most of the boys just pick up supplies here and try to get a grub stake to head on out to the mountains. I see. Well, didn't you ever try prospecting? Nope. Found a good wife, a pleasant way to live. I make out and I'm happy. Too many hill rats wasting their... The hill rats? Prospectors. Too many of them wasting their lives for that one big chance. I guess I'm not that much of a gambler. <laughs> Where would I be likely to find a chap like that, uh, um, a hill rat? Oh, Benton's full of them. If you want a real old-timer... Go down and see Shorthorn Tom. <laughs> Shorthorn Tom? Yeah. Nobody knows his real name, and he's probably forgotten it himself. You'll find him down at the shack's end of the street here. Turn left. Yeah, his place is the first one on the left. Good. I'll call on him. And look, uh, don't let him talk you into grub staking him. He's got a lot of crazy ideas about finding a lost mine. He's been at it for six years, they say. Well, I'll be careful. Say, uh, Mr. Kendall... Why don't you join me and the missus for dinner tonight? You'd sure be welcome. Well, that's very kind of you, Mr. Warren. Well, it's not every day we get to meet a traveled man like yourself. <laughs> uh, I'll see you later, Mr. Kendall. It wasn't hard to find Shorthorn Tom's place. I could have discovered it on a foggy London night by the smell alone. A ramshackle lean-to affair and had the odor best described as rotting fermented cabbage, which a moment later I found emanated from the gentleman himself. The old prospector was the most unwashed individual I've ever come across in my life. Bleary-eyed, he greeted me at the sacking that passed for a door. Um, um, Shorthorn Tom? 
I wonder if I could have a few words with you. What's the matter, boy? You got the heaves? No, I I don't believe so. <laughs> Sound like it. <laughs> you want words? Come on in. <clears throat> got me a mess of poop stewing. <clears throat> Light and rest your saddle, mister. Ah. What's your business? Well, I'm writing about the territory for a newspaper, Tom. I thought possibly you might be able to give me some information. Ah, information? What kind of information? Oh, the life of a miner, for example. Your life. <laughs> no, no, I'm quite serious. <laughs> you want to pay for information? Oh, well, I hadn't exactly planned on it. Then I ain't got no medicine for you. <clears throat> Five dollars? Yeah, I would see it. Oh, ain't you got no real money? Never did trust a bit of paper. I'm afraid that's it. Well, better than a sack of dingbats, I guess. Um, you uh, want some pooch? Is that what you're cooking? Yeah, tomato, sugar, and bread. Lost my teeth a couple of weeks back. Can't eat nothing but. I, I don't think so. Thanks very much. Well, <coughs> well, you go ahead and ask what you want. I'll eat. I... Uh... Understand you've been mining in this country for some time. Oh, 20 here, more other places. Got the biggest strike a man ever see six years back. Eh, but I lost it. Really? Well, I'd like to hear about that. No more than 20 miles from here, too. Except nobody believes it. But I heard there wasn't any gold to speak of here. You heard, you heard. Uh, Look, listen, mister. Oh, them's that tell you that don't know they're saddled from a prairie dog hole. <laughs> I'm not telling you. There's diggings over in them mountains, the high woods. I seen them. I know what's there. Gold. Five thousand a ton if it's worth a cent. What happened to it? Well, <clears throat> me and a partner was prospecting in the high woods. Got lost and caught in a blizzard. Sam. Sam, he was my partner. And he went west. Wind blew him clean off the trail, about a thousand feet down. Well, <clears throat> I found a cave, see... I figured to stay put till the weather broke. And that's where I found it. Uh, in the cave? Right in the cave. Indian or Spanish diggings, I figure. Nuggets as big as your saddle. Well, go on. Well, that's all. I brought the nuggets back. <laughs> Had me some fun. And went back to work the mine. And I couldn't find it. It's unbelievable. Sure, that's what they all say. Shorthorn Tom, biggest liar in Montana territory. Ain't nobody going to give old Tom a grub steak to make them all look sick as a mule. But they must have known about the nuggets you found. Mister, a fellow who's in it rich is like to give away more than I took out of that cave. Oh, that's how they figure I got the gold. Or it was given to me. It's quite a story. Yes, <laughs> ain't it? Now I'm between a rock and a hard place. Doing a job here and around to scrape up a dollar for grub. While up there, there's enough gold to buy me the whole dang town. When did you give up looking for it? When? <laughs> Mister, when you got gold colic like I got it, you just never give up. You sure you want to have some of this pooch? Mighty tasty. Uh, no, thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Eight times I've been back looking. Till I run out of grub. But one of these days... Hey. You wouldn't be interested in uh, in going partners, would you? Oh, um, I don't think so. It's very kind of you to offer. Yeah. Wait a minute. Let me show you something. Uh, <coughs> you, uh, you know what gold looks like? I've seen it. Yeah. Good Lord... That must be worth... 200, 250. Well, but couldn't you use this to buy what you need for another try? Could, but won't. If I spent this and didn't find the mine, <laughs> there'd be nothing left to prove what I know. Hmm. Well, it wouldn't cost more than $100. Man could take one mule for packing. Pretty good outfit. Oh, I ain't saying the best, but it'd do. Only on 20 miles from here. Well, how about $50? No, 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 100 And you know what? I got a feeling if a man wanted to put up a hundred dollars, this could be the lucky time. Oh, I've been feeling it for a week. The weather's good. This trip out, I'd find it. Well, Tom, uh, I have an idea for nothing else but the experience that'd be worth it. <laughs> All right. 
Yeah. Fifty. Seventy. And ninety. One hundred. If you don't find it, I'll be in your shoes. Flat. Busted. Oh, mister. Hey, hey, what's your name? Kendall. Well, Kendall, you got yourself a partner. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll take this here money and get us fixed up. We can leave right away. Bed out tonight. Oh, uh, where are you staying? No, I've got a room at the American Hotel. Meet you there in two hours. Oh, uh, Tom, mm, there's nothing personal, you understand, but I think a little security is indicated uh, in case of accidents. Oh, you figuring me to deal from the bottom? All right, I'll tell you what. Now, I'll give you the nugget, see? You trust me with your hundred, I trust you with my nugget. And if I don't show up in two hours ready to travel, you made yourself a profit. Fair enough. <laughs> Mister, you may not know it, but you're going to be one of the richest men in Montana. <laughs> or the poorest. I'll meet you at the hotel. In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. When you hear CBS News, you're hearing the results of worldwide watchfulness that pays off in accurate reporting sped to your sets with minimum delay. CBS News has reporters in every corner of the world. By keeping your set tuned to CBS Radio, you not only get your favorite entertainment, but the regular news programs of the nation's best reporters, plus special bulletins whenever they are called for by CBS News. Make the Star's Address your listening post on the nation's most listened to programs and for the nation's most listened to news reports as well. And now we return you to Anthony Ellis' production of Frontier Gentlemen. I had left Shorthorn Tom at a general store to buy supplies. Precisely two hours later, the old prospector was outside my hotel, leading a scrawny-looking burrow, which looked as though it would momentarily collapse under the weight of its pack. It seemed that we were ready, except for one thing. Shorthorn Tom was blind, roaring, drunk. Here they are, fighters! <laughs> I'm all set and ready to go! <laughs> I had me a little scamper juice to kind of start things off right. <laughs> Here, here's your nugget, Tom. Oh, you're an honest man, Kendall. Come on, let's get going. Well, if it ain't my old pal, Shorthorn Tom. Who? Oh, Kendall. You see this suck egg dog? Calls himself Willie Sanders. Worst no good son of a gun claim jumper. This or any other side of the Rockies. So you got yourself a grub steak, Tom. This uh, fellow you're playing for sucker? Sucker? Do you see this nugget, you river sniper? We're going to get more like it. You've been laughing at me and my gold in the Highwood Mountains, huh? Well, we'll see who's the sucker. No good varmint, but I've got a good mind. Uh, Tom! Tom. Ain't no good trying to rouse him, mister. He does it every time. You bet he poured a whole bottle of whiskey in him. Get stiffer and aboard. He'll be like that for hours. Give me a hand with him, will you? I'll take him up to my room. They won't let that old buzzard in the hotel. I think they will. Come on. I had the boy take the burrow to the stable. Then together, Saunders and I carried old Tom into the hotel. Up to my room and put him down on the bed. He was snoring quite peacefully. My companion, Saunders, was not of the nicest type. Thick black brows growing in an almost straight line across his eyes and a cast in one eye which gave him an even more villainous appearance. As I put Tom's nugget in my pocket, I saw him give it a sidelong glance. You uh, believe that story of his? I have no doubt of it at all. Nobody else in Benton does. Well, that may well be their misfortune. Uh, Did he tell you where the mine is? He gave me a rough idea. Now, thanks very much for your help. Uh, you uh, grub-staked him, huh? I grub-staked him. Good afternoon, Mr. Sanders. You uh, really think there's a mine? My dear fellow, I can't see what earthly concern it is of yours, but yes, I think there is a mine. Uh, how about taking a couple more partners on, uh, me and a pal of mine? Not interested, thank you. 
Uh, he find that nugget up there? You heard him. Goodbye, Mr. Saunders. Tom. Tom. <sighs> Two hours later, he was still asleep. I locked him in the room and went downstairs for dinner. The bill came to six dollars, leaving me with exactly two in my pocket and a growing doubt as to the wisdom of my investment. I was just about to get up to leave the table when I heard a voice behind me. Hi there, handsome. Yes, you. Uh, good evening. Mind if I join you? Well, no, not at all. Won't you sit down? I've been watching you from over there. You know what I said to myself? I said, there's a real lonesome man. A real lonesome man. So I come over to make you feel better. Oh. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm in quite high spirits, really. That's swell. That's real swell. I'm glad. <laughs> My, you've got a beautiful way of talking. Thank you. You're good-looking, too. Nice and tall and good-looking. Very kind of you. You know what I bet? Oh, I haven't the remotest idea. I bet you're from the East and you're going to look for gold. And I bet you find it. What do you think of that? Extraordinary. I'm Alice. What's your name? J.B. Kendall. J.B.? What does that mean? Oh, just initials, you know, J.B. Everybody calls me J.B. I like that. It's strong. J.B. Would you like to go someplace quieter to talk, J.B.? Not particularly. You see, I have a friend upstairs in my room. Oh? No. You don't understand. A gentleman. Not feeling too well. I am sorry. Then if you like, we could go to my place. Charming thought, but not tonight. You don't like me. Well, to the contrary, I find you irresistible, but I must say I question your motives. Hmm? Run along, dear. Your friend, Mr. Sanders, is much too interested in our conversation. Sanders? Who's he? The gentleman behind the pillar. See? I saw you come in with him before. Uh, would you be good enough to give him a message? Just say, no partners. Good night. Shorthorn Tom didn't awaken until the next morning, and I marveled at his recuperative powers. He showed not the slightest effects of the night before. We collected our burrow and left Fort Benton at sunrise and started south toward the Highwood Mountains. Two days later, we were in the heart of the mountains. Tom was in excellent spirits. He seemed to know exactly where he was going. You see that gulch, bro? I swear I got sight of it before that doggone blizzard closed in six years back. Yes, sir, we're on the right trail this time. Do so you mind stopping for a moment? Sure. I... I thought I heard something. Oh, man gets that way in the mountains. Here, a lot of things ain't really there. No, no. It, it sounded like horses. Oh, just echo of the old burrow, that's all. Uh. What's your real name, Tom? Oh, I ain't had none except Shorthorn Tom for so long I near forget sometimes. Eh, when I was a sprout, I, I had me some folks called Weatherly. It was a long time back, Kendall. What about Shorthorn? Where did you find that name? Never found it. It was given to me. That's what they called a tenderfoot down south of ways. And the name stuck. Hey, you got a handle, uh, except Kendall? Uh, J.B. J.B.? Um, Jeremy Bryan... Jeremy Bryan. Oh, partner, I'm sorry. Mighty sorry. Man could get killed out here with a name like that. Uh, trail's getting narrow yonder. You better watch your step. It's a long drop down. How much further from here? Oh, not much ways. It don't look like much. Just a hole in the rock. But when you get inside, she opens up to a sizable cave. Look, look, there she is. Come on. Well, it, it looks like a cave, all right, but you said the opening was small. Oh, it's the one, I tell you. You see inside. Come on, now. I'll watch your step. I will. Watch it. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. 
No, I can't exactly recollect whether it was on this side or the other. Can you see any sign of diggings? No. Oh, might have been a fall covered it up. Say, I'll use my pick here. You try where you are. We stayed there, working, digging at the solid walls of that cave for over three hours. Tom must have known it was hopeless, but he wouldn't give up. Only he shouted words of encouragement to me and dug into seams the harder with his pick. Then quite suddenly he stopped. I turned and saw him lying on the other side of the cave. Uh, uh, Tom. Uh, Tom? Oh, pain. Oh, my stuffings. Up to my chest. Ain't easy to breathe. Oh, here. Huh? Here. Lie on oh. your back. There we are. Oh, that's better. Ah, <coughs> oh, I tell you, J.B., I tell you. Oh, it's a cold trail. I, I, I know that sometime back this ain't the place. Don't feel it. It just don't smell right. I was kidding myself. It, it ain't the place. Oh, no, that doesn't matter. No, I guess not. No, no more. Oh, here, you, you take this. What, what for? I don't want the nugget. I told you. It's worth 250 maybe. I won't need it now. I'm going up Salt River, partner. Do uh, you mean you're going to die nonsense? Boy, one thing a man knows when he's old, buzzard bait like me, he knows when it's time to die. But listen, listen, you, you, you go on look and see. Them diggings is around here somewhere, maybe further along the trail. Maybe there's another cave along a bit. No, 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 Tom. Tom, lie back. No, out of my way. Tom. I'm going to find Tom. you just along the trail. Tom! That old Tom, he sure had the gold colic bad, didn't he? He dead, Sanders? Sure he's dead. Don't you figure, mister? Yes. Me and my partner here, we come up to see how you was doing. Didn't find the mine, huh? No, we didn't find it. Well, there's still the nugget. I seen him give it to you. Hand it over, huh? Gentlemen, I feel rather sad about Tom's passing. Be good chaps and let well enough alone. He kidding with that talk? Oh, he's a dude. He can't help the way he talks. Hey, you give us the nugget, huh? <laughs> Now, both of you, get up. Up! Now, each of you take a pick. Start digging. We'll bury him here. You give me any argument, I'll shoot you on the spot. After Shorthorn Tom was buried... I took the horses belonging to Sanders and his friend and started back to Fort Benton. I had the idea the walk would do them good. After sending my story to the Times, I had a drink for old Tom, then packed to leave for Helena in Montana Territory. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Joe Kearns, Don Diamond, Virginia Gregg, and Herb Ellis. Music was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Stay tuned for the Ford Road Show, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentleman. John Wall speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network.
In the mining country of Montana Territory, it seems that it's one thing to find gold and another to claim it as your own. Frontier Gentlemen. an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. <laughs> I've been traveling along the Mullen Wagon Road in Montana Territory, and I was looking forward to reaching Helena before dark when my horse began to go lame. And I realized I faced the prospect of camping out for still another night. I had just rounded a bend in the trail when I saw the small figure plodding along on foot ahead of me. He carried a pack on his back, and as I drew nearer, I saw that he was no more than a boy, 17 or 18. Hi. Hello. Going into Helena? Yes, but I don't think I'll get there tonight. Horse has gone lame. Oh. oh. Yeah, right foreleg, huh? Yes. He slipped off a rut a mile or so further back. Too bad. Thought I might get a ride with you. There ain't been many wagons along today. No. How far have you walked? Mostly from Fort Benton. Got a couple of rides day four yesterday. <laughs> See? Um, you don't happen to have any food on you? I ain't got much, but I could pay a dollar or two, I guess. Oh, I've enough for the two of us. You better save your money. Oh, that's mighty nice of you. Keep missing... your eyes open for a decent bit of ground, and we'll make a camp. About half a mile beyond, we found a somewhat sheltered spot a little way off the trail. The youngster, his name was Bill Richmond, gathered wood, and I prepared the food. It was almost dark by the time we had finished. Well, that was as fine a meal as I've ever eaten, Mr. Kendall. And I'm glad you enjoyed it, Bill. Did you smoke? Mm, no, sir. I haven't found a taste for it yet. <laughs> well, you've got time. Take my advice. When you do, use a pipe. Yes, sir. Where'd you come from? Kentucky. Mm, the long way. Yeah, I ran away from home. Wasn't much of a place. I figured I was old enough. <laughs> And you came out here for gold? That's right. Hey, you make any strikes, Mr. Kendall? No, no. I'm not a prospector. How did you get to Fort Benton, Bill? Mm, I worked my way up one of them river boats. I sure learned plenty about gold mining from some of them fellas. You know what it says there's places in this country where you can pick the gold right off the ground? Mm, I imagine the trick is to find those places. Oh, I will. <laughs> of course, I don't mind digging some if I have to. I wish you luck. Hello. Sounds though like we have visitors. How are you? Me and my pals saw the light of your fire off of the trail. You mind company? No, not at all. Uh. Ooh. Uh. My name's Jack Hinton. Oh, this here, this is Rod Goodall. Howdy. And him with a long face there, that's Dauncey Abbott. How are you? J.B. Kendall. The nipper is Bill Richmond. Oh, howdy. Uh, I'd offer you some food, but I'm afraid we used the last Oh, one. that's all right. We got our own grub. But how's the firewood? Enough, I think. <laughs> uh, Dauncey, your turn for the grub. Get going. Mm, nothing I hate worse than... <laughs> He hates cooking like thunder, but he sure knows how to make a son of a gun stew. Yeah. Oh, now that fire sure does feel good. You and the kid have any luck? Find any traces around here? And as a matter of fact, Mr. Goodall, I haven't been looking. I'm on my way to Helena. No, Bill is the prospector. Oh, that's so? Boy, are we just camping down for the night. I aim to try my luck west of Helena. So, huh? 
Well, now, boy, how come you wait until you get there? Well, I heard tell of big strikes. That's how come, mister. Oh, <laughs> now, you listen to me, boy. There ain't no sense going everybody else goes. But for all you know, you're sitting on a bonanza right now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're joshing me. No, no, I ain't. Here, Rod. Rod, ain't that the truth? It could be. Why, sure it could. Now, listen, I heard stranger had... Oh, they're pulling your leg, Bill. No, sir, no such of a thing, <laughs> mister. Now, boy, now, listen here. Me and the boys, we was working Deer Lodge country a year. But, Dauncey, you remember? I remember. Why, sure. Now, a couple of fellers right in the next camp to us. They got into a shoot-up. Next thing you know, one of them bites the dust. Other fella, he starts out to bury the poor son of a gun. He digs a grave right there in the camp, and what do you think? Yeah? Pay dirt. Lousy with gold. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Hinton, you'd take first prize with that one. In a minute, you'd have me believe in you. Oh, but that's <laughs> the truth, though. Oh, we've seen stranger things than that. And that's a fact. It was a pleasant way to pass the night. Three prospectors, hard-bitten, rough men, spinning one tale after another... They'd never find a better audience than Bill Richmond, and they knew it. I could see him absorbing every word. And it wasn't until the fire was getting low that we finally turned in. At first, I thought I heard the shouting in my dreams. And then I knew that I was awake, and it was beginning to grow light in the east. I made it. What What are you talking about, Bill? Just like they said here. I found it. Found what? The gold, the gold. Oh, boy, what's the gold? What? Look, Mr. Hinton. Mr. Hinton, so look here, gold. Gold? All night I thought about what you told me, you know? All them stories. I didn't even sleep for it. And this morning, this morning here, I got up and I walked up the gulch, and I found here, this. Now, let me see that. Iron pyrite, so betcha. May I see? Ain't it gold, Mr. Kendall? It is. The fellas on the boat, they told me what to look for. Iron pyrite, sir. Kendall. Don't see? Fetch me the hammer. Yeah, I got I got more in my pockets. Look at this Boy, one. Boy, will you shut your mouth a minute? Where'd you find it? Surface? No, no kind of kind of sticking out of a rock in a in a gully. I can show you. Well, I'm sure obliged to you, Mr. Hinton. Here's the hammer. If you want my opinion, you're wasting your time. That's gold. Sure it is, Mr. Kendall. Don't break. Ooh. It's soft. Ain't no alloy in it, neither. No silver or copper. Look at the color. Pure gold. Show us where you found it, boy. We followed Bill into a gulch which began no more than a hundred yards from the campfire. He turned into a shallow gully and stopped. I could see where he had cut into the rocky bank with his pocket knife. And I could see something else, too. In the faces of the men who stood over him. The guarded tones of voice. Bill? Bill, I would say that you've hit it. That's a fact. Ain't no question in my mind. No telling how far that vein goes. Say, don't, don't think I'll forget you, fellas, because I won't. I, I'm going to make a fine present to all of you. Well, that's mighty thoughtful, boy, mighty thoughtful. I imagine one stakes out a claim now, isn't that so, Mr. Hinton? Mm -hmm. Then register it in Helena? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, that sure is, Kendall. That's the thing to do. Uh, Bill? Bill, I don't guess you'd mind if me, me and the boys take a look on up the gully ways, would you? There should be plenty for all of us. Oh, no, sir, you go right ahead. I ain't no hog now. I got all I need right here. Good, good. Then we'll help you then to make out the claim, all proper and legal. Well, that's fine. All right, let's go, boys. Oh, uh, Kendall, you coming? Uh, in just a moment. Uh, Miss Kendall. Listen. I owe you plenty picking me up. Sharing your food with me, no? I'm cutting you in for a share of this. Oh, no, no, no. It's yours. If there's more here, I'll stake my own claim. No, no, you don't have to. Now, this here must be worth hundreds and thousands. Listen to me, Bill. The most important thing is for you to register that claim. Get title to it. Do you understand? Oh, sure, sure. All right. Have you got a gun? Uh, no, I ain't got no gun. Well, you know how to use one. Oh, I guess so, but... I'd take it, just in case of accidents. I'm going with the others now. If any more strangers come, don't tell them what you've found. All right, Mr. Kendall. You better go back to camp now. 
Wait for me there. Sure. If you say so. <laughs> I stayed with the three prospectors almost the whole day. We found traces all right, low-grade ore, but nothing really worth working. It was late afternoon when we retraced our steps to the camp. On the way, we passed through the gully and the site of Bill's claim. The sun had already fallen behind the mountains to the west, and there was a chill in the air. Can't just figure it. Just the one vein. Possibly it's a question of digging. Seems to be a number of gullies running off. We looked around these parts a couple of years back. Remember, Rod? That's right. I'd swear what the kid found's a freak. Might not go more than a foot or two and then peter out. No, don't look that way to me. I'd say she'd show better than... Oh, $2,000 a ton. Mm -hmm. Lucky boy. Yeah, ain't he, though. Say, Ken... You and the boy, you partners or something? Oh, no. Oh. I met him yesterday for the first time. Oh? A man can search a lifetime not find anything like that. Yeah. Kind of crazy, ain't it? We tell him stories and he takes us up on it and finds it. Think that'd be worth a share in the claim, wouldn't you? He sure as shooting wouldn't have come looking if we hadn't given him the idea. Sure. What do you think, Kendall? I think, gentlemen, that this is Bill Richmond's claim, and we'd better get it staked out for him before dark. The way you see it, huh? Exactly that way. Yeah. Well, might as well get on back to camp. Well, don't you think it'd be a good idea to help the boy to stake out his claim before nightfall? Well, I don't know, Kendall. I'm kind of tired right now. How about you fellas? I sure had enough for one day. Oh, well, that vein's been there a long time. Guess she won't be moving tonight. Kendall, uh, you know how to stake out a claim. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Oh. Well, I guess it can wait. Do something about it in the morning, huh? Because right now I sure could use some grub. <laughs> moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. A suspense story starring Agnes Moorhead and the latest action-packed adventure with insurance investigator Johnny Dollar are two of the exciting dramas waiting for you on CBS Radio today. If you like your listening on the thrilling side, don't miss Agnes Moorhead on Suspense. And don't miss Johnny Dollar's tense tangle with a spy ring on most of these same stations today. And now we return you to Anthony Ellis' production of Frontier Gentlemen. In the camp now, there was a very different atmosphere. Sullen, I think is the best word for it. A subtle hostility had settled like a gray mist. I saw the men huddled together as Bill and I prepared the campfire. And I had a pretty good idea of what they were talking about. Oh, she's going fine now, Mr. Now, Kendall. Uh, listen to me, Bill. I think we may be in for a bit of trouble. Now, no matter what happens, keep your head. How come? No time to explain now. You'll see. Just don't lose your temper. <clears throat> Bill. Yeah, Mr. Hinton? Bill, me and the boys been talking. Now, we figure while it's still light, you ought to get that claim staked out all regular. Mm, yeah, that's fine with me. Now, of course, doing you a service like that, seems how you nor Kendall know about such things, we reckon it ought to be worth something to you. Well, that's all right. I don't want something for nothing. There, see? See what I tell you, boys? He's a good kid. You was right. Uh, what was... do you think such services are worth, Mr. Hinton? Even shares all around. Cut you in two, of course, Mr. Even Kendall. shares? Just a moment, Bill. Pretty expensive, isn't it? I imagine a lawyer wouldn't charge that much. Ain't no lawyers around here, is there, Jack? <laughs> no, sir. Now, Bill, it's kind of like protecting your rights, you see? 
Because if anything happened and you didn't get to get your claim registered, why, the next feller comes along, the whole thing belonged to him, you see? Rather awkward situation, isn't it? It sure is. We're taking the gamble as much as you, kid. Why, heck, that, that vein might not be worth nothing to foot down. I was under the impression you thought it would work out to about... Two thousand dollars a ton. Look, mister, we're doing well, business with the boy, not with you. I'm representing his interests. That right, Bill? Yes, sir. Since when? About the same time as you decided to help him register his claim, Mr. Goodall. Well, what's your deal with the kid? Uh, we have a gentleman's agreement. Hmm. Pretty smart. And you come in for half. Presuming that I did. That still leaves him half, which is a lot better than a fifth share. As it happens, I have no intentions of doing so. You believe this dude, kid... Yeah, I believe him. Well, we ain't getting nowhere. Don't see much well get going on the grub. I did it last night. Well, do it again. It ain't my turn. Uh, come over here. You too, Rob. Have you got the gun on you, Bill? Yeah, stuck in my belt here. And keep your jacket buttoned. Don't let them see it. You figure they're going to take my gold away from me, Mr. Kendall? I think they'll make a good try. Well, I ain't going to let them. Keep your voice down. I'm sorry, sir. That sure gets me mad, though. I heard about claim jumpers, but I never expected to run into them this quick. <laughs> the price of fame and fortune. Well, they're going to have to kill me to get mine. Well, let's hope it doesn't come to that. Ah, the conference is over. All right, me and the boys got an offer to make. Happy to listen to any offer. You and the kid take 50%, we take 50%. Hmm. I'll make you a counteroffer. You take nothing, I take nothing, Bill takes all. You see, I told you. Now, look, mister, you ain't no position to make an offer. Till that claim gets registered, it don't belong to no one. Now, if me and the boys decide to stake it out for ourselves, what are you going to do about it? I imagine there'd be some shooting, don't you? You only got one gun. We got three. Would you like to draw first? No, it ain't no use that kind of talk. Now, nobody's talking about a shoot-up. We just want what's rightfully ours. We told the kid where to look. That makes us equal partners. I don't think so. Oh, no, sir. If the kid rides in to get someone out to stake that claim for him, you know we got the right to take over while he's gone. If I let you. It ain't your strike. He'll give me power of attorney in writing. You bet I will. What, what's he talking about? Are you a lawyer? No. Of course, maybe you'll ride to Helena. Leave him here. <laughs> Very doubtful. All right, now see how it is then? We got all the grub. You got none. We can just sit it out and wait. By and by, you'll get so hungry, you'll sell us the whole thing for some eats. Did you ever stop to consider that the wagon trail is not very far away? All Bill has to do is to wait for someone to come along. I wouldn't be surprised if there were one or two honest men who would give him a hand staking his claim... I'd be happy to stay here while he's gone. All right, all right, all right, Kendall, all right. All right, you win. <laughs> I guess we know when we're licked. Huh? Boys, we'll pull out. How come? Shut your mouth, Auntie. Say, we'll pull out. Kendall's right. Kid found it. His claim. And just to show you, Mr. Kendall, that there's no hard feelings, we'll leave you some of our grub. How's that? Extremely kind. Well, I'll pay for it, Hinton. Well, you figure it's oh, worth it. No, no, kid. It's a present to you. To make up for what we tried to do to you. <laughs> sort of a conscience salve, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, come on, boys. Let's get moving. I didn't have the heart to laugh at Hinton's clumsy attempt to put us off guard. They packed their belongings, and within ten minutes were riding off down toward the Mullen Road. At the same time... I had no illusions about our somewhat uncomfortable position. You figure they'll come back? I think there's no doubt of it. I'm sure glad I got this here gun. Then. I hope you don't have to use it. You all want me to get started on the grub? Yes, you might as well. <sighs> sure is something... What happens to fellas when they get a sight of gold, ain't it? History has a way of repeating itself, Bill. I went through something like this only a week ago in Fort Benton. You know what I'm going to do if that stock's really worth something? 
I'm going to sell out. You know, I'm going back to Kentucky. I'm going to fix things up just fine for my mom and pa. And the kids. Brothers and sisters? Oh, yeah, a whole slew of them. Eight. That's one of the reasons I took off. Hmm. Well, the immediate problem seems to be our friends. If I send you to Helena now, they might be waiting for you. On the other hand, if I go, they could come back here. I ain't feared either way. No doubt. But your claim won't be worth much to you if you're not alive to enjoy it. Hmm. Mr. Kendall? Hmm? What are you doing in Montana? Oh, nothing much, really, Bill. I think the word is drifting. I drift about. Do a little writing for a newspaper in London. London, England? Mm-hmm. So, you know something? I never did learn reading and writing. That's something else I'm going to do when I get back. Mm, it's a good idea. But we'd better make preparations to make sure you do go back. As far as I could determine, their most likely line of approach would be up a shallow draw. We packed everything we could find under our blankets to make it appear we were asleep in the clearing. An hour passed. The moon rose. Mr. Kendall. Yes. Yes, I heard it. Take out your gun, but don't shoot unless I tell you to. All right, sir. And keep down behind the brush. Now, boy, get him. <laughs> That should ought to have done it, boys. No. What? Wait a minute. It ain't them under the blankets. It ain't. Just a lot. Drop of your guns, cutting, gentlemen. Man. Stand just where you are. We, 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 we was just coming back to see you was all right. Your thoughtfulness shatters me. I told you it wouldn't work. Pick up their guns, Bill. Yes, sir. Now, gentlemen, we'll wait until it's light enough. Then you are going to stake out a claim. It'll be in the name of William Richmond. Are there... Are there any objections? Good. All right, make yourselves comfortable. And then while we're waiting, perhaps you'd like to tell us some more stories. The next morning, bright and early... Bill's claim was properly marked off, and to doubly ensure that there would be no more dirty work, our dishonest friends were led, well trust, into the sheriff's office at Helena. Bill's strike didn't make him a great fortune, but it was enough to take him home a richer man than he came out. I allowed him, under the circumstances, to reward me, and he did, very fairly. $1,000. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Eddie Firestone, Larry Dobkin, Jack Moyles, and Vic Perrin. Music was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Right after the Ford Roadshow, which follows immediately on most of these same stations, stay tuned for the New York Philharmonic Concert performance of Electra. And join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. John Wall speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>